I'd like to start by saying that although my name is on the brief, there have been many people who have contributed to the ideas that are contained in it and the presentation that I'm about to give. So many thanks to all of you who've uh, participated in this process, and I suspect I'll be adding more material at the end of today as well. The brief itself is, well, brief. And so this presentation provides a bit more context to the three key messages and the suggested negotiating outcomes uh, that we propose. So let me start with a presentation overview. The first point of these three is that climate change will affect agricultural production around the world. In many places for the worse, but with significant uncertainty uh, about what kind of changes, where and how much. Adaptation to these changes can reduce their effects and improve human well-being, both through research, new infrastructure, and institutional reform. Thirdly, mitigation. Agriculture is a major contributor of greenhouse gases and so can play a role in their mitigation, but it can also sequester carbon emissions from other sectors, a role that other parts of the economy do not have. So let's start, first of all, with talking about the impacts of climate change for agriculture. This is a famous picture, a well-known graph, which represents the historical record of rising temperatures since the uh, mid-18th century. The vertical axis indicates that there's been an increase on the order of a half to three quarters of a degree Celsius over the past hundred years. That's history, that's the historical record. The temperature changes, of course, could increase, increase much more. Here are some various scenarios uh, that the IPCC has looked at in the past. The ranges, uh, are from virtually no increase if we somehow manage to stop all greenhouse gas emissions today to substantial increases in temperature um, in a fairly short time frame. The green line that appears now refers to the time frame for the next two slides that I'm going to show you. So the consequences of this higher temperature, or the climate change, are higher temperature and more but shifting precipitation. Now, rather than feast your eyes on the individual details, think about this. Red is bad higher temperatures, lower precipitation, and blue is good. So look for the reds and the blues. In the left, temperature, uh, left side, the temperature graphs are all red, and the blues dominate the right-hand precipitation graph, higher precipitation everywhere. But these outcomes are clouded in uncertainty, not only about greenhouse gas emission, but also about what the climate models tell us about the outcomes. So choose your favorite place on the surface of the Earth and watch what happens when I toggle back and forth between two different climate models with exactly the same greenhouse gas emissions. The colors on the average remain the same, but the locations for the colors change substantially. Uncertainty. So if we move from thinking about the modeling to what are the effects on agriculture, it's useful to review sort of the history of thought in this area. And Doing this is because it, uh, the word agriculture is missing in much of the language of the UNFCC documents. No one has ever said that agriculture won't be affected by climate change, but the literature of the mid-1990s suggested that changes would be manageable globally, no, cha no problems in other words. Agricultural effects uh, of climate change would be manageable, negative effects in the temperate regions would be buffered by international trade flows. Carbon uh, CO2 fertilization was important to offset the productivity effects of the higher temperature and changes in precipitation, and increased trade flows were needed. When we get to the early 2000s, the worry begins to grow a little bit. Potential problems, but still manageable. Production in developed countries actually benefit from climate change. There would be declines in the developing countries. Regional differences grow stronger over time, and there, now the, the feeling is that there are substantial risks of hunger uh, in the poor nations. Two constants, CO2 fertilization important and increased trade flows are needed in order to offset declines in production in one, some parts of the world. When we get to the mid-20s, uh, mid-2000s, I mean the potential for, for problems is recognized as being larger. The uh, language of concern reflected the fact that while yields would increase somewhat in all regions, there'd be smaller gains in the temperate regions than in previous results. And again, there was an inc a continued reliance on this CO2 fertilization concept to offset the productivity effects of the negative productivity effects of, of temperature increases and in precipitation variation and increased trade flows would be needed. We've all know what's been happening with the Doha round negotiations on agricultural trade. What about the CO2 fertilization effect? It's needed in all these models to offset the productivity losses from climate change. 
but the recent news is not good. Recent reports on field experiments on CO2 fertilization are negative. What happens in the bell jars of the lab doesn't necessarily translate to the field for a variety of reasons. What do we think today? These are some very preliminary results that reflect some analysis done at, the, at, at IFPRI. I'm going to show you two of these maps. The first one is uh, for rain-fed maize. Again, the colors are what you should look at. Yellow and red are bad in terms of lower yields. Blue, light blue and dark blue are good. There's a lot of yellow and red in this figure. Maize yields decline on, on the order of 17% between 2000 and, and 2050. And don't forget, this is a world in which we expect a 50% increase in population and hopefully higher incomes, which means increased demand for food. Productivity increases, in other words, are going to have to include dealing with climate change as well as the demand for food from higher incomes. If you look at irrigated rice shields, you get an even larger decline. Think of this as only the temperature effect, because the way we do this model is to say the irrigated rice fields will have enough water, and so the only thing that happens with climate change is an increased temperature. Southeast Asia does not have a very pretty picture if these results actually happen. And don't forget that if the rivers that re rely on disappearing glaciers become more variable, what is now irrigated rice could well become rain-fed with the consequent effects on yields. Another result that we have, which is not presented here, provides for some op optimism. I call it my hap cuff hap cuff half full result. If you look at the varietal response, so these are done for a particular variety of maize and a particular variety of rice. If you look at the varietal responses, you find that there are very different effects in different parts of the world, which suggests an important role for agricultural research to look at location-specific returns to varieties, and also for information on where current varieties do well so that we can then transfer that information to other parts of the world. So our first of the suggest suggested negotiating outcomes for agriculture. Um, the question is, do we know enough about to understand the global we do know enough, I would argue, to understand the global and local effects of, of, car of climate change on agriculture, but there are large gaps in our knowledge, especially as we begin to look at eff effects in particular locations. So our first suggested outcome is that the funds need to be made available for research to fill these knowledge gaps, especially with the links between carbon, uh, climate uh, change and agriculture. All, all of the various modeling um, and analytical tools that we use in this world need to have higher spatial resolution. Agriculture is an intensely spatial activity. The integrated assessment models that provide the climate forcing scenarios and the climate models need to provide as disseminated outputs, in other words, not output that's generated but then kept in the lab, so to speak, but actually disseminated information such as minimum and maximum temperature, net solar radiation, wind speed, and direction. These would help to improve the biophysical modeling of agriculture climate interactions that we can do today to prepare us for the future. And it should perhaps not be so surprising to hear an economist say that better inclusion of socioeconomic developments in these modelings are extremely important. So adaptation. Adaptation is essential. Agriculture, of course, doesn't adapt. It's the behavior of people that needs to change. So what kind of changes do we need to think about? A key first point is that policies and programs that foster economic growth with more even income distribution and that encourage sustainable use of resources are also good for adaptation to climate change. Rural people, those who tend to make up the bulk of the world's poor, are also likely to be disproportionately affected by climate change. If they have higher incomes, they have more resources to adapt to the inevitable changes that they will experience. Secondly, as in the real estate business, location matters. We need to adopt location-specific analysis, location-specific programs, and location-specific policy measures. And finally, climate change will affect us all. It's not a national problem, it's not a local problem, it's a global problem. We need to have international institutions that can re enhance, improve our resilience collectively. These include international data sets that are freely available to all, international research institutions that can look at things in one country and figure out how to transfer them to others, and international 
agreements that make the collective exchange of information, data flows, and material flows between countries resilient to the expected changes from climate. Some ex specific examples, we need increased expenditures in agricultural science and technology. We need increased investments in water storage and management. More development of rural infrastructure, both physical, but also importantly, institutional development in the countryside. And then we need policy improvements to internalize the various externalities associated with environmental services generally and climate change effects in particular. Suggested negotiating outcomes include the funding modalities for agriculture in any, any uh, Copenhagen agreement. Recognize the connection between pro-poor development policies for sustainable growth and climate change adaption. Uh, adaption. Recognize and support the synergies that exist between adaptation and mitigation. Uh, provide funds for the various technology, infrastructure, and institutional innovation uh, that uh, are needed in order to facilitate resilience internationally and support those institutions that, that make that take place. In particular, I'm going to emphasize one element, good data collection efforts. It's a boring subject, but it's really critical. Good data collection efforts are not yet up to the task of what we need, and we urgently need more spending on data collection, especially high-resolution, spatially explicit data. But it's equally important that these data are disseminated freely and without restrictions on their use. Next, I'm going to turn to the role of agriculture in climate change mitigation. These are, I suspect, some fairly familiar numbers by now. For the world, agriculture contributes about 14% of greenhouse gas emissions, and land use and forestry add another 19%, and some people would argue that we shouldn't tra treat these separately. The developing world counts for over 60% of the ag emissions and essentially all of the land use emissions. So mitigation efforts need to include the developing world if they're to have an impact. There's a growing body of research, both in the lab and in the field that suggests there are fast, in fact, cost-effective options for agricultural mitigation. These include the items that I've listed here, changing crop mixes to include perennials, crops with deeper root systems that remain in the soil after the crop dies, cultivation systems that leave crop residues and reduce deep tillage. These practices increase soil carbon and also crop productivity. And we can shift land use from annual crops to perennial crops from annual crops and perennial crops to pasture and to agroforestry practices. A key issue in agricultural mitigation is, this ish, is what's now being called MERV. The, 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 uh, any effects on mitigation need to be measurable, reportable, and verifiable. There are promising technologies to do this, microsatellites with six meter resolution, inexpensive soil carbon tests that we need to make available by the time a post-Kyoto agreement comes into effect. Suggested negotiating outcomes, establish a chapter for agriculture-related mitigation and adaptation investments as well as part of any global mitigation funding mechanism. Include agriculture and land use from the outset of any post-Kyoto agreement, but allow for long-term means-tested adjustment opportunities. The principle of common but differentiated responsibilities implies that any funding should support mitigation of agricultural emissions by the poorest, but as countries progress and their income rises, the burden of mitigation should be adjusted too. Let me end with a few remarks. Climate change is a problem that we, those of us in this room and this generation, especially the current generation of humans on the earth are creating, but we're not gonna pay the price really, it's our children who are gonna bear the brunt of its effects. We must begin adaptation programs in agriculture now if we're going to be ready for the future. Agriculture is part of the problem. It's a significant emitter of greenhouse gases, but it also has a special role to play in its solution. We must include agriculture in the Copenhagen Agreement if we are to address the problems that our children are likely to face. Thank you very much. And one last point. We have just added to our IFPRI website some information that will allow you to take a look at your home and find out what the changes in the precipitation and temperature are going to be in your town between now and 2050. So take a look at the IFPRI website when you get a chance. Thank you very much.